uh, people lie to pollsters. All right. <laughs> when you start asking about discrimination, they know what you want to hear, and they will give you a more positive answer than is true. All right. So this makes it seem probably that it is more accepting than it really is. But the reality is you always have these two extremes, a group of about 20% that are not accepting, a group of about 20% that are always accepting, and then 60% of people who are in the middle. This is what young straight people say about themselves. When you ask young gay people what they think of their peers, you find the same pattern repeats. About 9% say their peers are very accepting. About 8% say their peers are not at all accepting. 80% fall somewhere along a spectrum in the middle. And stu uh, studies of prejudice call this the 20-60-20 rule. 20 are bigoted, 20 are supportive, 60 don't care. And your job as business leaders in Hong Kong is to empower, because what is really going on right now in Hong Kong, as in most of the world, is this. The 20% who are unaccepting are setting the pace. They're creating the tone that makes the 60% in the middle feel like they should follow along. You want to switch that so that the 20% who are fair-minded create the tone and the 60% in the middle follow along. You are never, let me repeat, you are never going to eradicate prejudice. No study has ever shown people are unprejudiced. What you can do, however, is shift the climate so that prejudice becomes socially unacceptable to express and to act upon. That is your goal. Well, one thing that we have learned is that change must proceed along a multi-pronged process, the 3P process we call policies, programs, and practices. How do you do that? First of all, your policies have to change. Your non-discrimination policies have to explicitly include sexual orientation and gender identity. The reason for that is not because it's a nice thing to do, but that we find that levels of harassment, levels of bullying drop dramatically when people are specifically included in the policy. And if you don't believe me on this, if you're a student of American history, I want you to ask yourself, if race had not been included in our laws in America, do you think we would ever have desegregated our schools? Secondly, your benefit policies can change. You know, I'm very proud of the fact that Barclays was the first bank in the world to not only offer partner benefits, but to do what's called grossing up in the United States, where they pay for the tax consequences as well of you getting partner benefits. Steps like that send a very strong message to employees. But let me caution you. If all you do is change your policy in your handbook and add sexual orientation and gender identity and change your uh, partner benefits, you're going to get in the situation that the gentleman over here referenced where it's on paper, but nobody's actually working to carry it out. You next have to think about what your programs are. What kind of training are you offering to your employees? What kind of events are you sponsoring at your company? Um, do you have a mentorship program? Richard's been a real leader in that for Barclays. Do you have an employee resource group? Um, do you actively recruit LGBT talent? And when you source, um, use outsourced um, Suppliers, are you actually looking for vendors that are LGBT or are LGBT inclusive? For example, one thing the United States government is considering right now, and this will be ironic when you get later in my presentation, is actually requiring that all contractors must have a non-discrimination policy that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. There's no reason your company can't do the same thing. And that then puts pressure on the people who are offering services to you, your vendors, to get on board. The next thing we need to look at is what are people's practices. And this is really where most of you are sitting right now, which is you're thinking, what can I do as an individual to make a difference? And I had a mentor named Chuck Willie, who was one of the first African-American professors at Harvard, where I went to school. And 30 years ago, he gave me the concept of the courageous push and the compassionate pull. Now, the courageous push is made by people who do not have privilege. And what that means is they are people who are, say, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, or perhaps women, or perhaps people of color who say, I am going to push against oppression. And that's what we usually think about creating change. But we forget about the compassionate pull. What is that? Those are the so-called allies, the people who come from the privileged group who decide, I'm going to use my position of privilege, and I am going to help open the door. I'm going to help pull people along so that they can be in a safer place. 
So for allies, these are for non-LGBT people, it is absolutely critical that you take action. First of all, when you hear anti-LGBT language or you hear jokes or whatever, you have to speak up. If you stand by and you let the language go by, you're basically saying it's okay. But don't just be reactive. Don't just wait till something bad happens and jump on it. Try to be proactive. And what does that mean? As the community business people noted, you can do things like change your own language to say partner instead of husband or wife or spouse. Secondly, you can be the person to raise the LGBT issues. LGBT people are not looking for you to speak for us, but we are looking for you to speak up for us. And there's a very big difference. Being that ally who says, I think we need to pay attention to this, frankly, sometimes you get heard in the way an LGBT person would not. So use your position of privilege to speak up and to be visible. And finally, um, I would urge you to think about other ways you can be visible. One thing we did in schools in America was we started the Safe Space campaign where we simply had teachers put up stickers on their bulletin boards with a pink triangle out saying, this is a safe space. There's now a movement to do the same thing in corporations. Put it up in your cube. It sends a visible signal to people who will now realize you are an ally. And I want you to keep this in mind the next time you hear an anti-LGBT comment. One of my other great mentors was Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize winner and Holocaust survivor. And he was asked once, what was the lesson of the Holocaust? And he said, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings suffer, endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. It's real basic if you're LGBT. Come out. Now I know that is not as easy as it sounds, but the concept of coming out dates back a long way. About 50 years ago, this is the first uh, poster for what was called the Gay Liberation Front back in 1970 in the United States. And my friend Jim Forat, who's in this poster, actually told me the story by it. See how it looks like a big group? They had so few people in 1970 willing to appear in a poster that they figured they had to run towards the camera. Because if they ran towards the camera, it would make it look like a big group. <laughs> this was everybody who was out pretty much in 1970, folks. <coughs> but because they came out and because other people came out, attitudes started to change. And guess what studies of prejudice have shown over and over and over again, and this includes LGBT people as well. If you know someone from the group, you're far more likely to be supportive of that group. And uh, when Amanda was doing her survey um, findings, I did some quick math on the back here. Here was the really frightening part for me, okay? 57% of the LGBT people are not out, all right? That's scary enough. But then Amanda made another point, which was not on the slide, which was that 70% of the ones who are out have not talked to anybody really about the fact that they're LGBT. So do some math with me. 70% of 43% is 30. So add 57 and 30% together. That's 87. That means the vast majority of people in Hong Kong not only don't know anybody who's gay, or even if they know somebody who's gay, they haven't talked about it. How can we expect people to be supportive of us if they've never even had a chance to talk? Two things I want to say about the process of creating change, actually three. Number one, it's a process, not an event. You're going to have to continually look at your policies, your programs, and your practices and keep asking yourself, are we getting better? You are never done. The second thing is, allies in the room, this is going to fall largely on your shoulders because you have the power. So if you want to see things change in your company, you're going to have to give that compassionate pull. You're going to have to create a climate where your LGBT colleagues can, point three, come out. So people think that employment discrimination has always existed. It actually hasn't. We can date its advent in American society, and that is April 27, 1953. President Eisenhower, at the height of the McCarthy scare, when there was also a fear that gay people were giving away our secrets to the Russians, and including the communists, decided to sign an executive order, Executive Order 10450, that banned employment of gay people by the federal government as well as in all federal contractors. That was the moment in American society when institutionalized employment discrimination became the law of our land when it came to LGBT people. 
This is the first picket outside the White House, 1965. The second man in that slide, the shorter man, is a man named Frank Kameny. He had been, he had a PhD from Harvard, and he was denied a job in the federal government because he was gay. And this made him very angry, so he organized a picket outside the White House. And this was the beginning of the movement against employment discrimination in the United States. I want you to stop for a second and think about the courage this took in 1965 for Frank Kameny and the 12 other lonely people who got out there in front of the White House to do that. In 49 American states, being gay was literally still a crime for which you could be put in jail or possibly put into a mental hospital and be lobotomized or castrated. In all 50 states, you could be fired from your job. The American Psychological Association at that point still declared being gay a mental illness. 1965, two years after I was born, this man, Frank Kameny, had the courage to go out there and say, you know, denying people jobs because they are gay is wrong. This is Frank Kameny 43 years later. That's the sign he carried in that march in 1965. It is being placed in the Smithsonian collection, the American Museum of History, as one of the great relics of American history. And he's holding the sign in his hand for the last time before he hands it over to the Smithsonian. The next year, President Obama issued a formal apology to Frank and the other people who had been fired by the government and gave, gave Frank the highest honor that we give civilians in America, the Medal of Service, for his work in ending employment discrimination in America. The reason why we are able to have gatherings like this anywhere in the world today is because there was a previous generation of people who in times that were much more scary, much more difficult, much more arduous, said this is wrong and this has to stop. And they created the space to where we could have the degree of freedom we have today. The way we repay them is to make sure the next generation has it better than us. I think about this day in Hong Kong, and I think like a historian. Someday, 30, 40 years from now, things are going to be unbelievably different in this city. And you will tell young people about needing to come to the China Club for this event and needing to have a study. And they'll think you're crazy. Just like when I talk about segregated schools, which I began in, in 1969 in America, I get the crazy Uncle Kevin look from my nieces and nephews. You'll be crazy Uncle Kevin someday. But you'll be able to say, I was there the day it started. But my final admonition to you is, it won't happen because time goes by. One of the great gay artists of all time, Andy Warhol, once said, they always say time changes things but you actually have to change them yourself. Things will be different in Hong Kong 30 to 40 years from now because there is a room full of Frank Kamenys here at the China Club today. May 17th, 2012. But it will only be different if you go out there and change them yourself.